Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Tony Miracker, and I am your uh, Section Toronto chairperson. Uh, we are in the uh, midst of a uh, COVID uh, um, situation where face-to-face uh, -face meetings are no longer allowed at the present time. So we are doing the next best thing and um, doing this webinar. Uh, our webinar tonight is uh, on 5G technology. Um, it is uh, sponsored by uh, our, uh, our SIMTI, um technical conference. Uh, we were supposed to have one actually tomorrow and the following day, which we had to cancel this year. But uh, we'll be back again uh, next year, uh, June 2021. Uh, tonight's uh, meeting um, has been uh, organized uh, with uh, two partners, uh, both uh, Peter Armstrong and Sylvia Fenton and myself. Um, we are going to be all sharing some duties. Uh, Peter is going to be manning the chat room and the question uh, room, and Sylvia is going to uh, assist by uh, uh, introducing our presenters this evening. Um, we do have four presenters this evening, and um, we will introduce each of them as they uh, come uh, to the point of presenting. Um, how this is going to work is uh, we're going to keep questions to the very end. Um, there will be an open forum for questions to all. Uh, again, Peter will be monitoring. If you have a question, you can either uh, raise your hand and um, uh, suggest that that will suggest that you have a question. Peter will open your mic and announce for you to uh, ask your question. Uh, you can type in your question or just type in, I have a question in the chat box. Or if you have a question because you don't have a uh, mic connected to uh, this webinar, then Peter will read your question on your behalf. Um, uh, let me just, uh, and that we will move on to Michael Martin, Michael J. Martin. Um, his presentation tonight is going to be 5G overview and 10 things that make 5G different. Um, Michael, you can uh, turn on your camera and your mic at this time. Uh, I'm going to hand over controls while um, Sylvia reads your bio. Go ahead, Sylvia. Sylvia, we can't hear you. You're muted, Sylvia. <laughs> thank you, Tony. I just opened your mic. Oh, thanks. I was on, um, yeah, okay, thanks. Michael Martin has worked in the media industry for over 40 years. He served on the SIMTI Toronto Section Board for four terms for a total of 16 years. He was twice honoured by the SIMTI for his service to the society. Today, he consults on advanced technologies such as AI, complex video surveillance, broadband networks, Internet of Things, satellite, microwave, and other sophisticated RF systems. Hey, Michael, you should um, have control. Very good. Uh, thank you, Tony. Um, so let me just see if I can get this where I want it to go. Um, 5G, everyone knows, is uh, something that's coming, uh, but it's already in 24 markets throughout the world um, by January 2020 and uh, 79 additional operators are adding it for a total of 39 new markets um, by uh, this 2020. So it's, uh, it's gaining traction significantly. Uh, it's a $41.48 billion business in 2020. And by 2025, it's expected to be Two hundred and seventy-seven billion dollar industry. 
So it's growing at a rate of 111% per annum, which is uh, significant. Um, if we look at tonight's agenda, normally I would cover uh, these 10 topics and about five more in uh, a week. Uh, so we're gonna try and do it in 20 minutes tonight. So it's, uh, it's gonna be pretty fast. Um, I'm trying to give you one key idea per topic so that you can at least have one main thought uh, as to what it's all about. And um, if you want more information, I'll give you a, a, a link to my uh, blog site. And there are some, um, uh, about a dozen or so articles on each of these topics that you can read more. There's a lot of pictures and graphs and charts. So it's uh, very visual and easier to follow. Um, one thing I will start off by mentioning is that we talk about 5G and you always hear the same two things, it's, uh, incredibly fast and low latency. Um, these killer speeds, um, I'll just be clear, they're not related to COVID-19 or any of the virus whatsoever. So uh, it's um, a lot of mythology out there, a lot of uh, crazy talk as to what's going on. But um, uh, it's, it's just uh, meaningless, um, you know, flat earth society type thinking. So first question is what's wrong with 4G? Why do we even need 5G? We get an upgrade about every 10 years. So we went through uh, 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, and we get an upgrade every 10 years. And, you know, a lot of, well, I'll say normal people think that if something isn't broken, leave it alone. But um, engineers tend to believe that um, if it isn't broken, then it doesn't have enough uh, features in it. So um, um, I'm having trouble, Tony, uh, changing the slides. Let me try the manual way, okay. So let's talk about the first one, Spectrum here. Um, spectrum is the most important part about 5G. Uh, there's some dramatic new Spectrum coming available. And um, spectrum is something that's very intangible for most people. You can't uh, see it, you can't feel it, you can't taste it, you can't hear it, yet it still exists. And um, without these frequencies, the whole cellular networks wouldn't work, any of the Gs, the G being generation, by the way. Um, these higher frequencies in 5G offer wider channels. And a lot of people confuse terms quite often like they think that broadband is the same thing as data rate and they're not. They're related, but they're not the same thing. So the width of the channel is, is much greater with 5G. A bigger, broader channel gives us uh, greater data rates. And that's uh, again, what makes it all work. Um, there's one, one very interesting development in the last few weeks. Well, actually quite a few developments in the last two weeks. Uh, and there's gonna be a lot more coming as we go forward. Um, one development was the United States sort of went rogue and uh, they announced a, a new uh, swath of spectrum that they call Wi-Fi 6. And Wi-Fi 6 was expected, but uh, the U.S. did something radical. We were expecting a couple hundred megahertz and they gave us 1,200 megahertz. So 1,000 megahertz more than we anticipated. But it's broadly considered to be a, a political action and uh, about 75% of that spectrum is expected to be used by 5G. Even though it has the name Wi-Fi 6, it, uh, some of it will be used for a new Wi-Fi bands, new Wi-Fi technologies that will also be faster, but uh, most of it, 75% of it is the prediction, will be used uh, for cellular, for 5G. So that's a, a big thing. Again, very political, uh, very different, um, uh, and unexpected. Um, we've also had, because of COVID, um, uh, the government of Canada just delayed the auction for the 3.5 gig band, um, the mid band, and they delayed it by six months. Again, Paul, political, why, why not stay on the course? Why change it? Well, you could argue that the economy is not good and, um, you know, the, but who, who is it not good for? It's not good for the bidders, not the government. The government wants the money from these auctions. So it's kind of a strange scenario. Um, with regards to uh, the bans, um, what 
I really want to um, bring out here is that there's going to be three bands, low band, mid band, and high band. And we already use the low band for 4G, 3G, 2G. The mid band we've been using for quite a while for um, 3 and 4G and uh, for other applications. So none of this spectrum is really new. Uh, some of it will become more accessible, but what we're going to get is broader channels. Um, in the low band, we only have small uh, channels that are uh, one uh, megahertz wide or 20 megahertz wide. In the mid band, we're going to get some bigger channels, 50 or 100 megahertz. These bandwidths allow us to carry uh, greater data rates. And when we go into the high band in the future, um, the channels will get even bigger uh, in the neighborhood of 100, 200, or 400 megahertz, which will give us these astonishing data rates. But what you need to know is that the auction for the spectrum for the millimeter wavelength or the high band is not even scheduled until November 2021. And we know that the mid band auction just got delayed six months. So could the high band one be delayed as well? Could be. The awarding of those uh, spectrum won't even happen to 2022. So we won't even see applications in there until 2023 to 2027. So uh, it's, it's a bit down the road um, for it. Now, when you have the bandwidth, you have the spectrum, you need modulation. And modulation simply means mixing of the baseband signal and this in you know in the case of SEMTI it might be video or audio or graphics animation VR AR um, we mix that with a carrier an RF carrier and um, and that's how we transmit it and uh, um, we're using largely the same modulation we used in, in 4G again so it throws a bucket of water on the uh, COVID um, and the radiation because it's all the same, it hasn't changed. What we're changing though in, in these early stages is uh, we'll be going to higher orders of modulation down the road. The power levels are not expected to change. So the radiation will still be uh, similar to what we have now with 4G. What I want to deliver here as a thought is that the data rates probably in the next five years will be around 300 to 500 megabits per second. You hear everyone talking about one gigabit per second or 10 gigabits per second. These are the theoretical maximum capacities of a channel in the millimeter wavelength, the high band, which we don't have. And these are shared resources. So no one person's gonna get the entire channel that's gonna be shared by many, many users. So we're going to have, um, we, we could get higher data rates and one gigabit per second when we get to the, the high band is is realistic. But for the next three, five years, we'll only have 300 to 400 megabits. So uh, just let me give you that as a message and, and the higher data rates, maybe up to one gig will come in three to five years from now. Latency would be the next one. I, I've given you a little chart I use here. Uh, people struggle to understand time and uh, we live in a world of real time. And, and I gave you some examples here. I have hundreds of them, but I, I threw some up here so you can see how long things take to happen. And when you were talking like on this call right now, you would hear a delay if it was around 150 milliseconds. So we're less than that right now, and you're, you're likely not hearing any delay. But I just to put things in perspective, um, there's some timing of, uh, of things in real life. But um, I wanna just make it clear that in the early days, the first year one to three, the latencies are still going to be pretty significant, very similar to 4G, and will get lower as we uh, get the new architecture in place. And um, Canada's a big country. From Vancouver to Toronto is 4,400 kilometers, and we normally measure round trip. So 8,800 kilometers, that's a long distance even with fiber optics. Today, the latencies are probably they're variable depending on what happens, but in the neighborhood of 50 milliseconds and as long as 400 milliseconds. So these are uh, one thousandths of a second measurement. So like 500 milliseconds is half a second, just to put it in perspective. So 250 millisecond, quarter of a second. 
So it's still pretty fast if you think about it, but um, uh, the latencies that we're expecting from 5G are less than 10 milliseconds, which is incredibly fast, or as low as one millisecond, which is faster than a fly's wing. So, um, you know, this latency is very important. It's going to be very important for virtual reality, for uh, video games, and a, a lot of different applications as we, we go forward in the future. Um, one of the things you, you need to know is we have these cell towers, and everyone sees them all over. In Canada, there are about 14,000 of them, and we put them on tower structures like this one in the photo. We put them on rooftops, often in downtown, or, and other structures like water towers. So we, we have a lot of them. And um, all 14,000 need to be renovated from 4G to 5G and updated. And a lot of it can be done with software, but we still have to change amplifiers. We have to put new antennas up. And the bigger problem is that the tower rules and regulations for Canada were updated in 2018. So many, maybe most, maybe I won't even say all, but pretty close to all the towers might have a need for remediation to strengthen them. And um, the biggest problem here, there's only about 30 high-end professional crews in Canada that can do uh, this tower work. Now, the cell carriers have them as well as the independent third-party crews, but there's not a lot of crews out there to renovate 14,000 towers. So we've got a big manpower problem in that we need skilled workers, um, and this is a, a great growth opportunity for the next decade for anybody who has skills and is not afraid of heights, then um, away you go. Uh, but we're going to see... Uh, this labor issue and this renovation issue will dictate the markets we hit. So the major markets, Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, Winnipeg, you know, Halifax, and that maybe in that order will get rolled out. And, um, and the secondary and tertiary markets will take a lot longer. So 5G in Wawa, Wawa Ontario is going to be a long time out. Um, you might get some pockets of development, um, Kelowna or Thunder Bay come to mind as um, growth areas, but uh, not a lot of them. There's a lot of work to do, and, and the rural and remote areas will be underserved or unserved for a very long time. And that's just to get to the level of 4G coverage today. And just to give you an understanding, in Ontario, um, our 4G coverage is pretty good, but it's still only 35% of the, pro uh, the province, of the footprint of the province. So, uh, but there's a lot of places in Ontario where we have no people, no one lives. So um, now on top of that, to compound it all, uh, 5G has small cells, a whole bunch of them, three different types, in fact, Fento, Fempo cells, um, Pico cells, and micro cells. And these cells do different things. They're, they're complementary. They augment the main cell, the large cells, <clears throat> which we also call them macro cells and we call these micro cells. Um, but let's just call them large cells and small cells. And the, the smallest one, the fen fento cell, think of it like a Wi-Fi access point that might go in your office and be connected with fiber and uh, serve you know a small number of users a handful of people so in a, a an office of 100 people you might need um, 10 of these things to cover the office and pico cells could be indoor or outdoor but we'll use them in stadiums we'll use them in shopping malls airports that sort of thing uh, but we could use them outdoors as well and micro cells we will use outdoors to augment so every cell tower in canada right now could have in theory um, 10 to 20 uh, uh, of these small cells to go with it. Ultimately, we would be needing to build 300,000 to as high as 3 million of these small cells. So again, same problem. Where are the crews coming from? Where are the bucket trucks coming from? Where are the infrastructure and the tools that we need? And all the infrastructure to coordinate, schedule, plan, uh, track, light up, energize, all this stuff. Uh, so it's basically a logistics nightmare that's coming at us as we go forward. One of the biggest changes in 5G is um, the architecture. And we refer to it as architecture, like uh, designing a house or a building. But it's the architecture of the network. And with 5G, we're using something called federation. 
And if you know about architecture, we started with a centralized architecture and think of like your big banks in Canada, they had a mainframe computer and when you go to a terminal or a branch, you, you connect to that terminal and all the accounts are held in the mainframe. That's a centralized model. After that, we got the uh, distributed model, which was like LANs, local area networks, and um, it moved the command and control out towards the users. And uh, we'd build LANs of hundreds of users, what have you, um, and servers and storage locally. Now we're going to back to the cloud, a new architecture, and, and with Federation, we're blending the distributed and the um, centralized together into a hybrid. And we're making little baby uh, clouds out at the edge, closer to the user. So as I wrote here, we're pushing the intelligence out to the network edge. And these baby clouds, uh, depending who you're talking to, we'll call them um, cloudlets. That's what the ISO refers to them as. Uh, we'll call them uh, fog computing. We have cloud computing, so fog, and there's another one called mist computing. So there's some uh, uh, fascination there with moisture, <laughs> but the fog computing low to the ground makes sense as a name. And then um, edge computing, which is a very common one that's used by uh, standards bodies a lot. So um, the way to think about federation is think of how the federal government of Canada works. We have the federal government, we have provincial government, we have municipal governments, and each layer of the government has its own role and responsibilities. Like the feds will take care of military, uh, the provinces will take care of hospitals, and the munis municipalities might take care of uh, libraries or swimming pools, that sort of thing. And these things can come together um, and uh, work in harmony uh, so that we can collaborate with each other. And just like, say, in policing, we have the RCMP, our federal police, but they're also the provincial police for, L uh, for BC, and they're also the municipal police for Burnaby, BC. So they can be very flexible. They can uh, fit in different ways in the way that organization structured. And, you know, 50% of all RCMP are in BC. Um, well, the network, the Federation network is exactly the same thing. We have it in layers or tiers, and we have different roles and responsibilities, but they can come together and, and augment and help each other um, when required. One of the technologies that's going to be really important is called MIMO. And we've had MIMO, it's an um, acronym that means uh, multiple input, multiple output. And the enemy of any radio signal is reflections, where a signal bounces off another building or off a granite wall of a mountain or, or any uh, sort of obstruction or gets absorbed by trees and foliage, that sort of thing, rain covered leaves. So these are all problems. So reflections are bad. They're very bad for radio signals. But what MIMO does is it adds the reflections together. And because they arrive at different times, it resyncs them all and makes a stronger signal out of all the multitude of reflections than the main beam of the signal itself. So MIMO is really good. On top of that, we're adding a, a what's called a multi-user function which allows us to simultaneously operate with many um, MIMO signals at the same time. So that lowers latency and improves throughput and allows for better connection and more robust signal uh, for our users. To add to MIMO, where there's a new technology coming called beamforming. And what we used to do with older cellular systems, we would just put up an antenna and blast out the signal to everyone uh, uniformly. And, and if you were in Toronto and we had Lake Ontario to the southeast of us, then we would be spilling energy out over the lake, even though there's no one there. So it was very um, inefficient. With beamforming, we know where the users are and we, we shape the antenna, we shape the signal electronically to send the signal directly to that user. So we narrow the beam down and, and the old way was like a shotgun blast and now we're doing like a rifle shot, it's a pinpoint. So we're sending more energy, stronger energy, better range, better signal uh, to them. And then when you add MIMO to that, any reflections, we aggregate them. What that means for users, if you're doing video or audio, which are both contiguous type signals, they hate fading, they hate um, all the problems that we have, like dropouts. Well, all of these things can be dramatically reduced 
with um, a beam forming. So that's very powerful. I mentioned edge computing earlier, and this is a very important thing. Uh, the cloudlets, the baby clouds, um, will put compute, storage, analytics, even artificial intelligence out at the edge, closer to the user. And it might manifest itself in your uh, location, at your broadcast station or in a studio, or even out in the field um, off of a tower. Um, it could be anywhere, or it could be in the central office of your local uh, cell phone provider. So by pushing the intelligence out at the edge, we, we have three different types of uh, data coming at us now. We have live data, like a video stream, for instance, a live camera. We also have legacy data where we have archival data. Um, maybe we're doing golf and we're watching Tiger Woods hit his putting shot, and then we can show the last three years of where he is. So the live shot versus the archival. Uh, the legacy data. Then we have external data, and external data might come from other users, um, data, statistics, subtitles, all kinds of things that can come along with that data uh, from third-party providers. Um, and that can all be blended at the edge, so it's very close to the user, and it, it creates a real-time scenario um, down in the, again, the 10 millisecond, sub-10 millisecond time frame, which will mean it's transparent to the user. It will look like real time. That's very powerful. Um, the next thing is what we call network slicing, and this is new. With 5G, all the network can be software defined, meaning we'll create everything in software. Um, in the past, we had it all in hardware, and uh, now we can do everything in software, the routing, the switching, the connections, everything can be done in software. And as a result, uh, we can virtualize the network. Now, initially when we do this, they'll strap up uh, slices of the network that will be optimized for certain things. For instance, uh, live video or live audio or VR, virtual reality. We can, we can strap up different types of connections. So, Eventually, though, we can strap up connections that are unique. So if we're a distribution company and we want to send a signal, say golf again, out to um, our golf fans uh, from uh, the sports network or uh, any of the sporting channels, we can customize that and, and give them their own unique channel. Now, I think initially the carriers will avoid network slicing other than to optimize it for certain types of signals. But eventually, they, we could have thousands of networks in the fabric so that we can start to have our own network. So large companies can have their own network. We do this today in, in some industries, but it's very rare. Um, and we call it MVNO and um, uh, it's not as common and the companies try and avoid it. But in the future, I think this could be a very powerful feature for uh, companies. The biggest worry I have is security. And you've probably heard a lot of this. Uh, uh, it's been widely reported. When we're federating the network, we're putting our content all over. We're putting it out at the edge, in the cloud, in other cities, from third parties, from servers. It's all over the place. In the old days, we had one data center and we treated it like a castle and we put our firewall around it like a moat. And then you had to come through the main gate. And if you got through the gate, and you're a bad guy, you could do whatever you want once you got in. But we were gatekeepers and we had one gate and it was very uh, controlled. Um, but now with all the content all over, the data is everywhere. It's going to be a whole bunch of little castles with a whole bunch of little moats and it's gonna be much harder. I predict that um, the security will be a big headache as we learn and adapt. We're gonna to have to federate the security and map it to the new architecture of the cellular network. So um, it's gonna be challenging for the early adopters, but we will get better and better and the pain will be less as we uh, move forward. So in conclusion, I, I know this is just 20 minutes here, but we're all on a journey here. That's what I wanna deliver. It's a longer road than you think. It's gonna be at least a decade before we get 5G as wonderful as 4G is today. 4G came out, it was dropping calls, there was all kinds of problems, not lack of coverage. Well, we're gonna to have to do this transition. We're still gonna be building 4G for the next three years at least. And um, 
and 5G will be built as well. But this is so complex, we're going to have to use artificial intelligence AI to help us manage it and administrate it. And um, uh, it's going to be a very interesting journey we're on, but it's another decade. And just if you haven't realized this, 6G, the next one, is now look, being looked at for 2030 is the scheduling time on that. So this never stops. We're on a, a journey here, and uh, it's going to have uh, uh, different levels to it. I'll um, end by just putting up the name of the blog site there, vividcom.com. And there's at least um, a dozen 5G articles, all the headings here that you've seen, and plus some more if you haven't, That and a lot of pictures and graphs, so very visual, uh, makes it easy. It's about no more than a thousand words per article, 500 to a thousand words. I also am very active on LinkedIn and um, I post every single day. I have a large following there. And um, if you you know, offer up connect, I'm happy to connect with you and you can get uh, this technology uh, focus as we go. Uh, Tony, I'm, I'm all done now and uh, I, I know it's fast and a lot of stuff there, but I hope that works and I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Michael. Um, at, and again, I forgot to mention that Michael is with uh, MyCan Communications and uh, there's his information, um, blog information, and I do uh, subscribe to Michael's uh, LinkedIn page and there's a wealth of information. So uh, it, it'd be uh, good to join because he does uh, have a lot of information. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. So our next presenter will be uh, Craig Snow from uh, Huawei. He's the Account Director, Enterprise Business. Um, I'm going to, uh, Michael, steal your control and give it to uh, to uh, Craig. And Sylvia, I'm gonna get you to, uh, to uh, introduce uh, Craig, if you can, please. Thank you. Hello, Sylvia, you are muted. Sylvia, you are muted. There you go. I have, I un I, yep, I have to wait for the prompt to come up. Sorry about that. So Craig Snow started his career in television production, attending Humber College in Toronto and working in various studio roles in a cable TV station, although ultimately following a career path in information and communication technologies. Craig is an accomplished consultant and educator, having worked with large firms like IBM, HP, and others, having taught part-time at Centennial College for several years. Craig has a private consulting firm, BST Management, but is currently working with Huawei Canada on building their practices around data center and communication technologies, as well as running webcasts and enjoying getting out on his motorcycle when, when at all possible. Good, thank you, Sylvia. Okay, Craig, you should have you should have controls, by the way. So uh, I will uh, sign off here for me and you take her away. Great, thank you, Sylvia and Tony. Um, as you can see on the screen there, just be under, underneath the Huawei logo, there's the easier um, website to find. So e.huawei, e for enterprise .huawei.com slash C gets you to the Canadian portal. Um, and while I'm with Huawei Canada, uh, you must understand that there's multiple divisions within Huawei. So the guys that are mostly doing 5G are the guys in the carrier networks division. Those are the ones that have to deal with the government regulations. Then there's the people that are doing the smartphones and tablets and laptops and stuff. Those are the consumer division. Um, I'm in the enterprise division and we cover data center equipment. Um, but there's some overlap and the, the, the wireless technologies, including 5G, are available for private use uh, for companies. And uh, this is where we're seeing a lot of uptake, especially in other parts of the world, um, stadiums, TV studios, uh, remote filming, all kinds of different places where the, the digital access has been uh, um, already added. 
Now, one of the things I wanted to uh, mention um, that Michael had pointed out was the the uh, the public spectrum auctions and stuff. There is still private spectrum, uh, so that companies can make use of uh, 5G technology, even to today's 4G and 3G technologies uh, for private use. And there's a different spectrum available for that that doesn't have to go through the same auction. So these are available today. Uh, let me, Tony, I clicked, but it's not going. There we go. Okay, so some of the things you want to understand is what th what's been happening in the past and, and where things have gone. So um, satellite networking was uh, used for a lot of remote stuff. Um, it was often used for field broadcasts and different things like that, you know, news collection in the field, uh, different areas like that, but uh, not very robust as far as speed goes. So you see a lot of people that have been using like Skype calls and stuff. You see the the reporters using it. You usually get a lower resolution image. You might get choppy audio and um, it's also subject to dropouts. That's that's not really the way you want to go on some things. Um, on the other side of things is the fiber network. So even your Bell 5 service at home or uh, just generally fiber optic networking. And, and that's what ties a lot of things together in the background. That's incredibly fast, but it's also incredibly expensive and it's very limiting. Uh, you know, if you're going out on a shoot somewhere to a remote set, it, you can't just go stringing fiber along with you. That's not gonna work out too well. Um, and especially for news pickup and you know, you can't carry fiber around with you. 5G on the other hand, hits somewhere in the middle um, gives you the ability to have, you know, even 4K streaming. So you got your high resolution uh, video, you got high resolution sound as well. It's very easy to turn on and you can actually take the antennas out on top of a truck if you really wanted to. So some of the other things that have gone on in the past, just looking backwards. Uh, so back in the 80s, there was some, some wireless stuff. This was the first generation of cellular, or actually probably more like second generation of cellular where it came together. A lot of these things are really software controlled, as Michael had pointed out. So some of those smaller sites that are uh, looking after things, they've actually got a series of servers looking after things on the back end. So it's like setting up a, a data network as well. Then you get into larger equipment as it went through the 90s. Today, it's really into the 4T, uh, 4G and the LTE networks. Um, industrial Ethernet pieces are the corporate networks. And there's usually a fiber backbone connecting building to building, um, even if they're not using fiber within a building. Uh, and then they'll have wireless access points. And they, those have gone through an evolution of other characteristics and capabilities as well. Uh, today, we're getting into the 5G networks with, the, uh, with more uh, advanced antennas and more advanced software behind them. There, there's a whole farm of servers that are in behind to look after things. Uh, and that can tie also into the industrial IoT pieces as well. So you get program logic controllers and other sensors and different things going on. And as well as what Michael had said, different edge computing pieces, even AI components that are going into those to make sure it understands what's what's going on the wire and uh, gets into some of that um, bandwidth slicing because it can tell the characteristics of the data traveling and could create a slice for that data. So when you start seeing the, the 5G networks, this is the primary network here would be the carriers. So the intention is that the carriers would have a 5G network offering, and that would be the primary network that's available to you and your crews and everything that you're doing. Uh, and then there would be a secondary 5G network. Now the secondary network would be the one that you own yourself. So you can put up your own smaller antennas, the micro antennas and Pico cells like uh, Michael had mentioned. Um, that's going to tie back into your own data center and the core is likely going to be optical to connect it into the primary network core. So you get the same kind of technology, um, but then you can provide you know, campus coverage means just any geographic area. So it could be a, a movie set, it could be a, a stadium or an arena, or it could be uh, you know, a small studio, whatever it happens to be. And then some kind of engineer is gonna have to look after that. 
that. So where you depend on the carriers to provide con connectivity like a utility, somebody's actually going to have to look after and maintain your own uh, networks. So as we look to a little more detail of what that secondary network solution covers, there is, of course, going to be some kind of antennas. They're probably going to be the microcell and the picocell that uh, Michael had mentioned. There's also the, the really small ones that are really no bigger than an access point, and uh, they're they have about the same coverage as an access point. Um, some of the ones that I've seen now actually has the latest generation Wi-Fi 6, as well as a 5G antenna all in the same unit. So you can do Wi-Fi and 5G from the same uh, devices. You've even got a couple of wired connections on the back to tie into the rest of your infrastructure and get you going that way. As we look at how those would go together, I know some of this may be small for you to see, so we'll just go quickly through it. The pieces here, as Michael had said, there was, there's a whole bunch of pieces that run in a cloud. So some of the biggest pieces of that is OSS. This is your operation services and support. Um, and that all ties into BSS is also something like your billing systems. All right, now chances are you're not going to be billing on your internal stuff if it's a secondary network, but those, those are the main pieces. And then there's a whole bunch of smaller components that all run as virtualized apps. So there's going to be some Linux-based servers mixed into there. They could run in a public cloud or private cloud if you've got that as well. Um, but if, uh, if you need to, you can just run them in your own data center. Um, on small servers. This is a big contrast to the way things used to be, you know, even 10, 20 years ago, uh, where to run those OSS systems and BSS required a Solaris based server from Sun, and it was uh, running a Spark processor in it, and they were like $100,000 for one server, and you needed lots of them still. Um, one of the things that's happened over the years is that switched over to very low-cost, off-the-shelf servers using Linux and uh, virtualization platforms. This is also where you hear things uh, like Red Hat comes in as the operating system, SUSE, and uh, uh, perhaps some of the others as well, but there, you get into the uh, OpenStack processing as well. So this is the open systems piece and that. Um, some of the different scenarios are there as well where you could have different systems running. Uh, it all really comes down to you're going to have some antennas, you're going to have some cable, and you're going to have some servers running it, probably a virtualization engine. You're probably going to have to have some workstations that uh, your operators and engineers are connecting into to watch it and monitor it all. So where we look at uh, the deployment, um, we can actually do these things relatively quickly. Uh, I've seen things done in as few as three weeks where they go through the, the planning and figuring it out, get the antennas up, make sure there's a cable back uh, to the data center, and then turn it on and start tuning. So there's some easy ways to deploy this relatively quickly. Um, for private use. Now, of course, the carriers, like Michael had said, are gonna to have to go through a lot longer process of updating antennas and uh, putting new ones out. Some of the nice things I've heard, though, is that the 5G antennas uh, are smaller and lighter than the 4G antennas. So there, this is a really nice thing for the carriers in that they'll be able to remove the old 4G antenna, put the 5G on in its place, and it's actually going to be smaller and lighter, so there's not as much of a, a concern on some of the poles and uh, towers and uh, tops of buildings and stuff. Uh, the other side of pieces would be that they would use something like the microcells, put them into a neighborhood box. You've, you've probably seen small little brick buildings in your neighborhood, and it's not a house, it's just something that's there. It's usually tied in as a uh, some kind of switching office for your telephone systems and Rogers for, for cable systems and different pieces like that. Uh, inside of what the, might be a little brick building is often uh, a small construction trailer with just a brick veneer on it. And inside that is probably a couple of racks with some switches and a few servers. Uh, even some of your streaming services would be caching onto storage that's sitting into one of those little boxes and, and that. The other way is right down to the Pico cells where they put these on lamp posts. Um, so th those is another option to really densify the coverage and, and get it around. 
Slicing is probably one of the most important things that you're going to see in the 5G architecture. And, and as Michael had alluded to, that you can actually have different networks for different pieces. So as is shown here on the left, you can have one slice that's just for produ production. You can have another slice out of the network that's for IT support. You can have another slice for internal communication, and that communications could be voice. Uh, it's going to be encapsulated voice. So we're talking about voice over LTE, or in this case, voice over 5G, um, but it, but it's your voice network. So you instead of having to have a, a radio communications network for certain things in the field, um, you can do it all over the same antenna. You can have your data going across it. You can have your uh, streaming services, and you can have your um, voice communications as well. So it all ties in together. And um, if if Huawei gets to be involved with things and that they can be on the corporate side, then they've also defined things called a starter box. So it already comes equipped with, okay, here's your three servers that you're going to need. Here's a small antenna or here's three antennas or four antennas or whatever. They actually have starter kits to help people get going. And some of those are different uh, sizes depending on the amount of coverage they want. So as I mentioned, there's some mixed spectrum. There's some private spectrum that you don't have to go through the auctioning with. Um, municipalities already have a slice carved out for them as well. So you will find some municipalities kind of becoming their own ISPs. There's a network of wireless ISPs across the country. They're usually looking after the rural areas. So where the uh, the big three guys or big four guys are looking after the, the cities and the highways in between them, um, there's a whole network of wireless ISPs that look after the small or smaller rural site. They set up their own tower. They put a device on a customer premise uh, that put you put a SIM chip in it, just like you would your cell phone. Um, but it looks like the the home box that you'd get from Rogers or Bell, uh, and it serves out your Wi-Fi locally and uh, and gives you some wired ports for printers and games and TVs or whatever else still needs wired connections. So that's a couple of ways of dealing with it. You can either mix it with the public and private access, seeing as we don't have public for most of the parts, you're probably going to uh, have separate access right now and, and take it separately. So looking back at the, you know, the actual broadcast workflow. Now this is uh, whether you're on site for a sporting event or outside for uh, television that's out on a remote set or whatever it happens to be, um, but there's the same four general areas so you've got the capture which is the, the video equipment itself audio equipment would be in there um, the contribution side of things is, is actually usually going to be a truck right uh, you've seen these trucks when they're out on filming pieces uh, or maybe you're lucky enough to have a small studio built into a stadium an arena something like that it goes back to a master studio uh, and then it has to go out over the distribution network this is for live events and live tv it has to go out and whether um, the consumers are going to reach it on a TV or the streaming device or over a satellite link is, is whatever it happens to be. Now, when you layer the 5G on top of this architecture, here's what you get. Bing. Um, so now you can actually have cameras that are enabled with 5G, audio systems as well. You can have drones that have a camera and a 5G chip in it. You can actually go send that back to uh, the truck, you can still use a truck if you want, but realistically, you could eliminate the truck. If you've got a public network that can give you a 5G slice back to the studio, you don't need the truck outside. So it eliminates a lot of, of uh, equipment. You don't have to be lugging out heavy cables for things, and uh, it makes it really simple to get out there. I've even seen a private news capturing device, a portable news capturing device uh, that has, you know, a, a nice little gimbal with. Um, uh, even a cell phone, a little LED light, and uh, a little uh, directional microphone with, with uh, you know some windsock on it and everything else, so you can do that. Really nice way to go out. You don't, you don't even need the great big uh, cameras if you if you really are, are tight. Um, but that can then go straight to the studio, and the studio can distribute it right away. If you're looking for really private communications, then you could go all the way to the end consumer, just like we're doing uh, tonight, and going from you know, each of our own uh, machines to another machine. It doesn't even have to go through the studio. 
so here's where things change a little bit. Um, as you can see out at major events, so, so I picked on a stadium, but this is Canada. Realistically, it's going to be a mix of stadiums and a whole bunch of hockey arenas, uh, that type of thing. Uh, you can get by with a few cameras, and uh, you'll see up in the top here, there's a backpack device. So a live broadcast backpack. Uh, now, whether that goes back to a van or some kind of satellite truck for communications, that's something else. If you get the benefit of a, an actual control center in the arena or in the stadium, whatever it happens to be, if they've been nice enough to give you that, uh, then that's great. You might have a cable connection or a fiber connection back to the studio and uh, the, where they'll do all the overlays and everything else. Um, what you really like to, is uh, the the latency on this. What we've seen in some of the stadium conversions that they've done, uh, where the earlier ones, you know, a year ago, two years ago, they were dealing with seven milliseconds. So think back to that chart that Michael had. Uh, so seven milliseconds was the latency. Still, you don't notice the lag, but it, it's there. Now we're seeing some of those down to the one millisecond. Uh, latency part. So it's it's really the live feed. Now, if they decide to put a delay on it later for censoring or something like that, that's a whole other piece. And of course, the end devices may be buffering. They may still be on a cable device or they may be on a, an old cell, cell cellular network or they might be um, uh, coming in over Wi-Fi, whatever. So the, the local devices might be buffering as well. Uh, but that's that's a whole other uh, ball of wax for them. Now, so also built into this, it shows on the left-hand side, we've got our 4K camera out in the field. I know people are already using 8K cameras, uh, and then they have to step it down to 4K in post-production. Uh, but if you're going to do live broadcast, it's 4K, you might as well just limit it to 4K now. Forget about the 8K later, especially if it's sporting events and things like that. You, know, you probably don't need the 8K later. Uh, the backpack gives you public um, access into the network gives you all of that and then it sends it back in through your private cloud where you got the different pieces going on uh, with the different servers that are there running as virtual machines in a cloud um, or you can go straight back over the the public network and uh, straight out to other uh, video platforms uh, it could be even a, like a YouTube or or something like that and do that uh, and then it has to go through the uh, the other end of things where somebody receives it in their home and what they're what they're going to do with that so this doesn't uh, necessarily take into account a whole lot of post-production stuff. This is still live broadcast over high-speed connections. This is a nice little look at what goes into that backpack. If you really wanted to, you can see it's got a screen on it. So you could have a director or somebody standing behind the guy that's running the camera and actually see what the camera is seeing right on their back. It's got a battery built in. It's got the 5G antenna built in. It gives you everything that you need to, to run around without dragging heavy cables. And then you could still plug mics into that as well, or it's on top of the camera. So the, these actually do exist. They're available in the market now and uh, going all over the place. The other uh, piece for live capture would be the, the use of drones. Uh, lots of this going on, especially for sporting events, um, some TV shooting as well. Uh, of course, the mics aren't on the drone, so you're not getting the buzzing of the uh, the blades on it, you're just getting a nice stable video. Uh, and some of those can run for quite a while uh, on the uh, battery that we've seen. Uh, if they're running it electrically, I've seen some of the larger ones go for more than an hour. So you can uh, deal with that. Then they've got a charging stand. It can land on the stand, recharge, take off. Uh, you might need a few of them, but um, it, it depends on what you're doing with it. And then the back end also gets into bonding the um, the streams as well. So when you've got multiple 4K streams coming together, you probably need some kind of mixing software. This can actually happen uh, in the field as well. So you can eliminate the truck, you can eliminate uh, a lot of the studio work and just put it all together and send it back out over the whichever stream you want. So it's a very simple way to put it all together, all encoded and uh, realistically you can get into encryption as well. You might need a little more horsepower in the backpack. This is a look at some of the devices that uh, you could use in the field or at home, as I mentioned, for those wireless ISPs. This, the, the name CPE is Customer Premise Equipment. 
Uh, so this is something you would use for that. Now, what you can do with some of these CPEs is hook them up in a wired connection to something that's already got an Ethernet jack. So if it's already got a one gig port, or, or if you're really lucky, a 10 gig port, one gig is all you're gonna need, really. But you can hook that up to this device. It's got this, the, uh, the 5G or even 4G chip uh, ones are available today. Um, you can use that like an antenna for uplink. So that it becomes like your, your cellular modem. Um, so it's, it's, it's like using your phone as a tethering uh, piece for a hotspot, except it's wired. Uh, so there's outdoor ones, there's indoor ones, there's mobile ones that, that also provide the Wi-Fi piece. There's dongles, so this is like a USB type thing. You can put it in device, into devices that support uh, a USB connection, and there, there you have your little antenna. If you think way back, I remember where there was cards that used to go in your laptop, and there was a little pop-up antenna and everything else if you wanted to uh, use it like a modem. So this is the same kind of thing, only up to date. And uh, then there's other modular ones where they're really just made for internal stuff, uh, and somebody would have to work with the manufacturer to get it added inside the equipment. Now, some of the one of the other really nice things is that there's actually a 5G backhaul network. So instead of having to be connected by a wired connection, so you've got an antenna that's out there and then it connects to a fiber optic link to give you that high speed, you can actually do 5G to 5G, antenna to antenna to create that backhaul network to get you through. And then you can put things together more like a mesh. So as, as Michael had said, you're roaming around between them, um, you, you don't get the, the lag and drop as it transfers from one antenna to the other. Uh, or if you just have, you know, four of them around a stadium or six of them around a stadium um, it, it can bounce around on the different ones it does get amplified because of the uh, uh, the, the par partially with the beam forming but also with the 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 overlapping uh, piece for the MIMO So this is kind of a nice picture that shows you what it might look like. So this is using either microwave or directional pieces, uh, pulling it all together. And uh, if you're trying to pull together different buildings, whether they're, they, you know, they might be different studios if you're in the TV industry, um, or it could be different studios in, in the movie industry as well. But you could pull them together wirelessly uh, back to a central tower. Uh, you wouldn't have to worry about all the, the fiber optic cabling and what goes on with that. So you can do that and pull them together that way. Uh, the device in the bottom right there is an outdoor uh, environmental one. There's no fans, no moving parts. It's got some big cooling fins on it. It's good down to like minus 45 degrees Celsius or something like that and good up into, you know, uh, uh, 40 or 50 Celsius above uh, that where, where your, your blood starts to boil at that point. Hopefully you're not out in that. But that's what it could look like as you pull it all together. Some of this, of course, if you can share it with the public networks, gives you an offset that you don't have to do all the investment into uh, the different equipment um, and, and you share their access and pay a fee for it. Uh, if you're getting subscribers onto that, then you could also deal with um, revenue sharing. If, uh, if they're going to pay for access to it. So this actually gives you another couple of pictures of what the, the antennas might look like. You can see down in the bottom left, there's a little rack device uh, that's got a couple of servers, a UPS, and, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> a UPS, a couple of servers, and probably a couple of wired switches to go with it and then different uh, classes of the antennas or RRU is a remote radio unit, all right? So that's there. Then the super blade is smaller. Um, again, they just did different output, different uh, capabilities. And then you've got the really small ones, the, the microcell and picocell type ones uh, that Michael had mentioned earlier, they can go together as well. And uh, you'd plan mapping, say a picocell, You'd, you'd map it out much like you would wireless access points. Uh, they don't have much further coverage than that. Uh, you, you, you have to have a lot of them. Again, a couple of diagrams of where this goes together. Um, this was actually all tied together where uh, uh, it had Munich, London, and Bangkok all tied together for different pieces 
and they had to put all of the stuff together. You can see the changes from what was there. The, the first diagram is as is. That was with the LTE equipment. Um, the second one was uh, swapping out the LTE antennas with um, a 5G. You can see it's much smaller. And likewise, on the other uh, side of things, you get the one plus one equals one. And you get some of the blade antennas that are directional. You can put multiples of them on a mass and put, tie it together. The little cabinet beside it is a power box. Uh, so it has batteries in it. It probably can be cellular, um, not cellular, solar, solar. Solar recharged on that, or it can actually have wires, uh, depending on what you need and how far in the field you are. And this then mentions some of the power devices. So like I said, that little box beside the the, the small tower is uh, a power box. And that's usually gonna be uh, DC voltage, right? So the, this is not, you're not trying to get 110 power or 220 power. They're gonna be DC voltage going out to those antennas. Um, very cool, very low wattage. Uh, you don't have to worry too much about it. It doesn't run very hot at all. Uh, and it runs a long time on those batteries. And I think we're uh, keeping pretty close to time, aren't we, Tony? We are. This is great. Excellent. So there's the longer form of the website. If you wanted to look up some of the private access use of wireless networks, you can cruise through there and uh, find some of these things on different antenna styles and uh, whatever it is you're looking for. Thank you, Craig. If you uh, can, I'm going to steal control from you. And if you can uh, uh, douse your camera and audio and uh, Cyan, if you could turn yours on, that'd be great. Our next presenter is uh, Cyan Savendathan. Um, he's going to be talking on uh, when it'll come. Uh, he is uh, with Bell and he's the senior manager IOT, Internet of Thing Channel Partner Program. So, uh, Sylvia, I'm going to ask you to uh, read uh, Cyan's bio and introduce him. And, Cyan, I'm going to give you control. Cyan is a seasoned sales leader with 15 years of experience in ICT telecommunications. He is currently a senior manager of IoT channel development at Bell Mobility. Cyan has an executive MBA from Athabasca University and also an executive management certificate from MIT Sloan School of Business. Cyan sits on as a special board a special advisor board member to many early stage companies in Canada through his partner status at Good News Ventures. He is also an active volunteer. He participates in several initiatives at Children's Aid Society of Toronto and Toronto Community Housing. So Anne, you should have control and um, uh, I think you need to Oh, you just unmuted your or muted unmuted your mic. Take it away. Thank you, uh, Tony. Um, just trying to get to this uh, presentation here. Give me one second here. Perfect. Thank you. Before I begin, I just want to thank uh, Tony and the SMT team for organizing this, this event, and I also want to thank uh, my peers, Tony Jones, Michael Martin, and Craig Snow for their presentations on 5G. Today, I'll be talking about 5G from an operator's perspective. Um, this slide here I'm gonna talk about, I think it was mentioned earlier uh, with regards to Michael and, and Craig's presentation, but I'll get in more in depth. Uh, 5G basically prom promises to deliver a significantly better performance, enhanced mobile broadband, basically faster peak data speeds, um, the ultra reliable low latency communications, which is lower latency, connections allowing devices to respond faster. Uh, the massive machine type communications uh, also provides greater density, allowing for a significant increase in device support and also provides uh, overall better user experience. On this chart, it basically shows you the benchmark, the 4G benchmark and the 5G benchmark. You can see 
the peak data rate is at one gigabit per second uh, compared to 5G is 20 gigabit per second. Uh, the, experience, the user experience data rate is 10 megabits and compared to 5G is 100 megabits. The latency is uh, at 4G is at 10 milliseconds compared to 5G is at one milliseconds. I know this was mentioned earlier in the presentation, but I just want to recap it again. Um, the spectrum efficiency is 1x on 4G uh, compared to 5G's benchmark is 3x. Uh, the mobility kilometers per hour is 350 kilometers. Uh, the benchmark for 5G is 500 kilometers. Um, the connection density devices per kilometer square on a 4G benchmark is 100,000. Uh, compared to 5G benchmark, it's uh, 1 million. The next slide over, second here, is the spectrum. Uh, spectrum, again, was mentioned again in the previous presentations, is a finite range of radio frequencies used for communications and is an integral component to Canada's telecommunications infrastructure. 5G leverages spectrum in the following frequency ranges. Um, 600 megahertz to 6 gigahertz, uh, sub-6, and the 24 gigahertz to 86 gigahertz, which is the MM wave. You can see it in the, um, the diagram right here. There is 600, 600 uh, megahertz, sub-6, 5G, and the MM wave, 5G right here. The MM wave is a higher frequency spectrum. It's enabling faster speeds and lower latency. The MM wave can um, require up to 10x more cell sites to match the existing LTE coverage. And uh, as Michael mentioned earlier too, as well, with regards to the 5G spectrum, it's uh, going to be announced in 2021. Um, that's why, it, hence the, the number 2020 to 2021. The next slide over here basically is what is 5G used for uh, in terms of business products and service opportunities? 5G can be used for remote uh, driving and control. Um, virtual reality training, and MBFR, which stands for Mobile Broadband for First Responders. Uh, basically, for remote driving, um, we can have access to remote control of AV vehicles and machinery, um, enable productivity in isolated, dangerous uh, environments, and it's ideal for construction, mining, and road tests. Um, the next one is for virtual reality training. Uh, the benefits of virtual reality training is you can eliminate risks and safety concerns. Uh, reduce training budget and time, and also provide scalability in real time on site training scenarios. With MBFR, it's a mobile broadband for first responders. It provides access to Bell's networks even though during rare times of network congestion. And first responders can uh, receive information to help them prepare and be more aware of an emergency situation. The next slide here is basically use cases. Um, there's three components, three um, categories. Uh, the first category is enhanced mobile broadband. Um, basically, it's for wireless fixed bed. It's used for fixed uh, wireless fixed broadband. Well, what's going on here? Sorry. Yeah. Oops. Sorry. So um, the enhanced mobile broadband is um, used for fixed wireless broadband, uh, immersive entertainment, uh, AR and VR, uh, intensive smartphone and data usage growth. Uh, the next section is massive IoT, uh, used for smart and safe cities, connected cities, environmental monitoring, uh, manufacturing logistics. And the third category is low latency, uh, is used for mission critical services, autonomous vehicles, and remote healthcare and surgery. The next slide here basically is uh, on market insights, what the uh, the world is is doing basically in the United States of America, um, they are uh, continuing to take an aggressive approach on 5G. They've launched it uh, early stages um, in, in 2019. Verizon, Sprint, AT and T, and T-Mobile. Um, their speeds are a bit lower. Uh, it's from 350 megs to two gigs. Um, there is no solutions right now to date on 5G, um, and they are basically. Um, you know, they're the fixed wireless with 5G launch. With, there's, it's, it's basically launched with certain carriers. Again, like I mentioned, Verizon, Sprint, AT&T, and T-Mobile are the ones that are launched this uh, 5G uh, last year. In Europe, um, Sunrise, Vodafone, uh, Dusha Telecom, um, they have already launched it. Um, basically, they are, um, um, they're having one mobile hotspot and one, smart, one smartphone available at launch. 
Um, there's no 5G apps or solutions available, but the focus is on AR and VR technology. Uh, the folks down in the in Asia and Korea, they're they've um, they've hit over three million uh, subscribers. They're well advanced. They're five months in, in with they're five months into it with coverage, um, and also expected to reach ninety three percent of the population by the end of this year. Uh, they're pursuing basically video game services such as online gaming, uh, VR and AR, and ultra high definition UHD, and they also offer unique content through partnerships and development. These are basically the market insights through US, Europe, and Korea. The next slide here is basically what the US carriers are, um, their speeds and so forth. So just a, a chart here. Um, network speeds in the US are behind in Canada. Um, they're, them launching 5G will give them the same speeds as what Canadians have right now with 4G. Um, right now, their national, their average download speed is from 40 to 45, 50 megs, um, megabits per second compared to Bell, which is 160 megabits per second through 4G. With 5G, they're at 235 and above. The next slide here basically is what to expect. Um, I mentioned this earlier, um, there's 5G speeds, are the early 5G speeds are very comparable to 4G speeds today. Um, coverages are selected for limited market for certain markets um, and also there's 5g smartphones available um, it came out last year um, again i mentioned again early 5g speeds are very comparable to 4g speeds available today in canada the next slide here um, is basically the, the devices um, that uh, are basically compatible with the 5g um, there are smartphones available right now with 5G compatibility, the Samsung X20. Um, they're expected to be more thicker and more expensive than 4G uh, smartphones due to pricier components and the need to support more radios. Um, the early 5G devices will need more to, will need to be fine-tuned over time as technology and solutions mature. Um, other, other, other major device manufacturers are, are not supporting 5G yet, um, example, Apple. Uh, and again, the key, the key message is the 5G devices are expected to be thicker and more expensive. The next slide here is basically uh, comparing um, you know, the speeds uh, with the carriers and so forth uh, with the devices, as you can see, um, the actual DL speed with AT&T is 1.8 gigabits per second. This is right now in Los Angeles. Uh, it's using the MM wave technology. Uh, and the phone is the GS10. Uh, they have a phone GS10 5 gig and it's coming out June 22nd. Verizon again um, is using 1.3 gigabits per second. It's in Chicago and using the technology MM wave. Um, there are other ones, SK Telecom, uh, they're using sub 6G. So you can see the differences between the technologies is sub 6G and then there's the MM wave technologies. The next slide again, is this a, a high level overview of when the spectrum auction timelines, um, those spectrum auction timeline happened in 2019 for 5G trials. Um, there was, there, this was postponed um, the 3.5 gigahertz uh, for mobile use, as Michael mentioned. So these, this timeline's a bit will change as we go, but a commercial 5G deployment has started in 2020 among all the, uh, for, among the three carriers. So this, uh, this slide is basically talk about uh, how to get ready for your 5G, how to get, how to get your network ready for 5G. Um, the first component is fiber. Uh, you need to have fiber to begin your 5G uh, journey. You need to have, the next one, you need to have dense cell site clusters. Um, third one is you need to have network 3.0. Um, the fourth one is 5G trials. And the last one is low power LTE M. So the next slide here are just depicting what I mentioned here. Um, it's a cell site densification in urban areas. I think Craig mentioned in the area, there's um, locations where you can have microcells and fecal cells. Some of these are, uh, are, 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 are um, 
devices that basically can trigger that that starts a 5G um, again the 5G network so forth. So you can see here there's a kiosk here. Uh, this is a tel on a telephone pole. This is uh, by uh, an advertising location. The next one is uh, transforming the network for 5G, which is network 3.0. Um, it's your network data centers, uh, regional and edge data centers to host virtual network functions. The next one also is virtual core instant for services once in, once access in place. And the last one here is automation, uh, automated network operations through an open platform, ONAP. The fourth slide here is to, with regard to 5G trials underway. Uh, usually the trials happen in, in urban areas or small towns. Uh, there are 50 plus sites right now currently used for trials uh, across the university campus, uh, automated, automotive test facilities, and uh, WPPP wireless, uh, wired, wired, wired WPPP test clusters. So it's the wire to the home premises. Some locations are they're trying 5G there. The next uh, slide is also, sorry, I'm over, sorry. Oops. I think we get this right. Yes, this slide is basically um, it's an LTEM network. It's riding on the 4G network right now. This is used for IoT. Um, we, Bell and Telus and Rogers, have, have launched the uh, low power um, LTEM network. This is um, a, a, sub, a, subsidiary, a, a software of the 4G and which will complement the 5G um, services when it's, when it's officially launched. Uh, there's more information about this LTEM network on our website, bell.ca. Um, so if there's more, if you're interested, you can definitely read about this stuff. Uh, the next slide here basically is a recap of 5G from an operator's perspective. Um, US carriers need to launch 5G today to offer faster speeds because they need to catch up to, um, to the carriers, gigabit um, classes. So Bell and some of the other carriers in North America, in Canada have gigabit speeds through LTE. So uh, the US uh, carriers have very low speeds with 4G. So that's why they're launching 5G. Uh, the maturation of 5G will start in 2021 with broader coverage and relevant applications and more affordable devices. Um, transformational solutions for businesses, enterprises can already be deployed on 4G, including mobile broadband, smart cities, mobile IoT, public safety communications, and LTEM, which I mentioned earlier in the previous slide, uh, is low power band, low power, um, uh, low power bandwidth, low power bandwidth for LTE is part of 5G. It's already been deployed by Telus and Bell across Canada. And this slide is about Bell. Bell basically prides itself in this network. Um, we, have spent, we have spent over $20 billion in our network since uh, 2016. We spent $5 billion a year. We have over 7,000 technicians working on the network. And uh, we also have 80% of the network. So Bell is, Bell's core business is the network. And we basically focus on a network and we want to make sure that Canadians get the best uh, access to connectivity. And that being said, this is the last slide, and um, this is uh, some key terms I mentioned, like the MM wave network slicing. This is available in this presentation. Uh, it's recorded, so you can get these uh, definitions as well. Tony, and I'm done. Thank you so much. So, Ian, thank you. Um, uh, we will uh, now move on to uh, Tony's presentation. Um, here we go. I will, uh, work. so, uh, Tony's going to speak about, um, the, uh, how the industry will use 5G. Uh, we've heard from Michael, um, talking about 5G, how it's different than 4G. We've already heard about how it works from Craig and then Cyan just, uh, ended up with, uh, when will it come? And Tony's going to bring it home with uh, how will the industry use 5G. Um, 
So I'm going to do some moving of controls. Uh, Sylvia, if you want to hop on and um, read uh, or introduce uh, Tony. Okay, thanks. Tony Jones has advanced the cutting edge of digital video technology for the past 30 years. Starting in R&D, designing post-production digital video effects technology at Quest Tech, he moved into digital transmission systems for satellite cable, IPTV, and OTT through Tran Tanberg Television, Ericsson, and now MediaKind. As principal technologist, he currently reports to the chief business officer for MediaKind and plays a key role defining core technology for the portfolio from video processing to TV platforms, including high dynamic range, cloud technology in the media space, and end-to-end -end storage and ABR delivery optimization. Tony Jones received BSc ENG degree from Imperial College of Science and Technology in London and has had eight international patents granted to, relating to advanced digital media. So, Tony, before you begin, uh, you should have control, by the way. Um, just so everybody knows, uh, Tony comes to us from uh, Great Britain. So I think he gets the um, farthest away award. That's one of the benefits of doing virtual um, meetings like this. We get to call in uh, the experts uh, all over. So Tony, uh, take it away. You should have control. Thank you, Sylvia, and thank you, Tony, and thank you to Sempty for making this um, opportunity. Um, yes, I am still awake, surprisingly. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the applications um, for 5G in the media space. Um, but first, I'd like to set a bit of context and start to talk about the changes in the media landscape and um, work out from that where 5G fits into that pattern. Um, first and foremost, one of the big changes over the last uh, number of years is cloud for media. Uh, typically, when you start talking about cloud for media, the initial reaction is for somebody to think about public cloud and public cloud providers um, and so forth. But it's a bit more complex picture than that. And the technology is, is perhaps the more interesting element to consider. Um, public clouds were developed in the first place primarily for transactional type uh, processing, where you make a request usually to, to a front end server. There's a database that packs it and provides a, an answer to you um, and allows that to scale to very large sizes. And that's really the automation side of cloud technology coming into play. Um, that was built for scale and removed a lot of manual operations that were needed in the past. And that's the, the key attributes that attracted some of the operators um, around the world to start looking at cloud technology for, um, for the media world. And the pioneers in this were really the uh, cable and telco operators. But rather than looking at public cloud, they're looking at on-premises installations, basically using the same technology, but using something like VMware in the early days to deploy virtual machines. Uh, what this allowed them to do then was to remove a lot of the manual operations that were prone to errors and cost a lot, a lot of money because it, it meant real manpower doing the job and replace it instead with something which has much more automation and much more deterministic behavior. Um, as an example of that, one of the real pioneers that was in North America was a cable operator, a very large, well-known cable operator, who initially launched with 11,000 cable channels. Um, and you can see, if you're working at that sort of scale, the need for automation and the, the cost savings and operational benefits of that are, are pretty obvious. Um, I think they know it's something like 14,000, so it's a pretty substantial um, set of, of channels they've got lined up. Um, now, these were obviously on-premises and still are today, and started off being uh, virtual machine-based in the way that most software transitions from being an appliance through a virtual machine, and then ultimately, if they're heading towards cloud, it'll end up being a containerized environment, which is cloud-native. Um, and you can look at that as kind of a pioneer. And the question then is, well, obviously the benefits were obvious, but what were the barriers to doing it? And the key barriers to doing it was the fact that at that point, dealing with lots of incoming feeds on ASI would have made it impossible to make that transition. 
So the key enabler to make it possible to use the technology was um, transport stream over IP. And we'll see the parallels to that in a little while. So that's the first step. Um, but the rationale that, that made that a sensible choice is equally applicable to some other parts of the media chain. It was just the operators had the scale and the drive and the technology change that made, made that possible. So some of the things going on in the industry, uh, there's a fairly widespread change to, uh, if I can get that to click. Hmm, that's interesting, that didn't advance anywhere, okay. So we've got a software as a service trans, uh, transition taking place, which um, always runs in cloud technology, but that's that's fine. And of course, streaming. Um, a streaming service is typically using um, ABR as a delivery mechanism. Um, people often call this IP, but this is only one way you can use IP. IP is a kind of more generic technology, as, you, as I'm sure you know. Um, streaming then opens up the possibility of more um, advertising, personalization of content. Um, so that's another part of this, the changing landscape, along with one of the trends on the inbound side, which is remote production. Now that's a particularly pertinent thing right now because COVID has driven a lot of the changes that people were thinking about making in terms of reducing manpower out on site for sports events and making it a necessity. Um, so this sort of accelerated the way that works. Um, but this is a non-trivial change to make and it doesn't make sense for every event and every type of environment. So there are some times when you still want to have people on site and sometimes when perhaps you don't. We can then look at uh, UHD. This is a fairly easy one. It basically, in terms of technology, it just increases the bit rates we need in all over, all over the place, right from the start to the end. Um, and finally, a change to more direct consumer, which is where the content owners are more responsible for delivery. And this is pretty much always using the streaming technology as, as a means to do it. So what about 5G then? So we can start to look at um, 5G itself. And these are projections which are from one of the industry mobility reports um, that came out in 2019. And the, um, the reality is that year on year, the traffic growth over the mobile networks is increasing 68% year on year. That's an incredible uh, rate of growth, as you can imagine. And the rates per handset is doubling about every, every three years. And of course, there's an increase in the num number of handsets as well, which hence the first figure. Um, and you can see from this graph that by 2025, roughly 50% of the traffic across all mobile networks will be over 5G. So for sure it's rolling out. Now the key question is, what, what about the demand? I find this this next part of the, the equation much more interesting, which is even though the growth rate is so large, um, what we can see between 2019 and 2025 is that video is not only dominant, it's already dominant, it's almost two thirds of the traffic already, but it increases as a proportion of that increased capacity by 2025, so it's over three quarters of the traffic. So our media world is responsible for driving the demand for 5G, um, and hence there is, is inevitably a link between 5G and the media side of it. Some of them are obvious and some of them are perhaps a bit less obvious. So if you just recap on some of, the, some of the attributes of 5G, the obvious one gets talked about all the time is the bandwidth. We all know about that. Enhanced mobile broadband means faster broadband. That's all I'll say on that particular topic. Fixed wireless access is one of the interesting ones. And we've touched on that a number of times through the sessions already. And one of the things that's interesting here is that you only get the really colossal bit rates at a sustained rate if you can provide the power for the radio part of, of the receiver end of it. Um, now, the engineers amongst us will all go, hmm, I know that the power consumption is a, is a distinct function of the bandwidth of the signal, um, but 4G and 5G likewise are pretty clever in the way that you use the radios in that the, the radio portion of the handset receiver is depowered for periods of the time when it's not expecting to be transmitting or receiving. So it's actually very power efficient. But if you want to do some of these media applications that require continuous data flow at high data rates, then having something which can provide a high level of power to the system that's receiving it works quite well. So the combination of the directional antenna that Mike talked about 
earlier and powered fixed wireless access terminals means that you can actually generally do connectivity at high data rates particularly if you're on the millimeter wave spectrum where you can allocate a big portion of bandwidth in order to be able to, to connect it so then we've got ultra low latency reliable communications is what it is and Sean talked about that um, distributed cloud now this is not an obvious part of 5g but it's an inevitable consequence um, you saw, I think Tony said that there were 14,000 towers in Canada. Now, interestingly, that 14,000 number happens to be just, just coincidentally happens to be the same number of channels as uh, our North American cable operator happens to be running. And for the same reasons of scale, you can't manage that manually. You can't have people turning up there or even dialing in remotely to try and do things by hand. You have to automate it. So cloud technology is the obvious way to deploy, maintain, upgrade, configure, and so forth, um, that, that software. So what we'll see is that as the processing capability at the edge that's necessary for 5G rolls out, then that will be done using cloud technology. Sure, it won't be in a data, one big data center, it'll be distributed, but it's the same technology that works that way. And this is a pattern that reflects the um, change that, again, Tony indicated, which is, 10% of um, cloud compute today is not in a standard data center, but it's moving towards 75%. This is one of those paths that that's happening. And there are others too, that, but this is one of, the, one of the ways. But that opens up some applications for cloud native deployment at the edge of the network. Um, another facility of 5G that's particularly interesting for the media applications is flexible upstream and downstream. Um, what this means is that the duplex operation is time division multiplexed in, um, in 5G, which means that you can dynamically change how much of that spectrum you use for downstream tra traffic, in other, in other words, to the terminals from, from the towers, against how much traffic is being used for upstream. So if you're contributing to an event from an event, you can obviously see the benefits of being able to change that um, balance between upstream and downstream. Uh, network slicing, we, we touched on this a bit earlier, and I'll come back to that. I think that's been well described. And finally, the other parameter that we see is the narrowband internet of things, which is used for um, diverse connectivity to small devices. There are five of these which are particularly interesting for media. And what we'll do now is have a look at some of those applications and see what we did with them. So first of all, improving media applications. Um, better video on mobile. So as you've seen, the number of handsets is increasing. The number of the amount of data rates per um, terminal is also increasing. And partly that's a change of, of habits and viewing habit and people watching more content on mobiles. But it's also a reflection of the fact that the screens are now almost without exception, at least HD capable. Um, so the bandwidths that need to be delivered to give the, the right experience on those devices is also higher. So part of that viewing pattern change and the device change demands more bandwidth, and that's delivered simply by the enhanced mobile broadband giving the, the higher throughput. Fairly straightforward. But we, what we also see, though, is that the, the ability to put processing at the edge um, and have this distributed cloud available means that we can start to do some more sophisticated processing that's more media-specific at the edge of the network. So one of those things might be just-in-time packaging. So this is where some devices might be um, HLS-based um, devices. Some might be Dash-based devices. Rather than deliver so totally separate versions across the backbone through the network and to the, the devices, if they're watching the same thing, you could package it differently at the edge um, and repackage it into the right format and do it once. Um, perhaps more interestingly, though, you can do things like personalization at the edge. So when you go and ask for a manifest as a client, it's possible that at the edge you can do some manifest manipulation, which will redirect to either an advertising that's personalized to the, the particular device or the per, per particular account, or perhaps it enforces some blackout rights management or, for example, blacks out adverts where you may not be able to read the text, that kind of thing. Um, and finally, the possibility for flow management. Now, all these devices attached to 5G are going to be receiving their media via ABR, using ABR. 
and ABR is notoriously difficult to get stable in a contested network environment. And one of the tools that the network has is to be able to pace the delivery of traffic to take away more of the control from the client device and impose what it wants from the network site. So that's again something that can be used to improve the way that the content's delivered so that it's smoother and, and um, more deterministic for the clients and it's a better experience. So some interesting things that can be done using that um, cloud-based distributed um, edge processing. We can then start to look at some of the other applications. So the remote production has been talked about to some extent already. Um, and of course, we've got the video over IP backhaul in order to make that possible. So this is now where we're starting to go see the parallels between the transition that the operators made. Now we're starting to look at the broadcasters. Now the broadcasters have equally important desires to not run their own infrastructure if it doesn't make sense, and also to be able to scale and and um, offload some of that processing to somewhere else if if they can. And like with the operators where the physical interconnect is one of the barriers to moving it into a cloud environment, um, the broadcasters are now starting to see that if they can remove the dependency on baseband SDI, then it's possible to start moving some of the studio infrastructure into a more IP-based environment, which then lends itself to the possibility of being into a cloud environment. And that, of course, could be a public cloud, which maybe is quite sensible for broadcasters. Now, if you want to, to connect baseband um, Ultra HD over IP into the studio, you're going to need more than 5G to do that, to do that if you're going to do it from multiple cameras. So this, this would only work in full baseband mode if you've got fiber. However, um, that's not the only way to do it, and you can start to compress it a bit more lightly um, and still make good use of it. And th this is an obvious example where you could put f fixed wireless access infrastructure in place for a high bandwidth upstream connection. So the things that make this possible then are the enhanced mobile broadband itself, because you need to have that, fixed wireless access, because that's the way that you get the high rate connectivity distributed cloud to be able to think, apply things like SRT to give deterministic latency um, in inbound fees into the, into the studios and network slicing to protect the traffic against everybody else's data. And this isn't just theory. Um, in fact, we, we did this um, well, it's nearly two years ago for the US Open in 2018. Um, so what we did here was we had um, a, an installation that was a combination of uh, a, a mobile platform provided by Intel. The radios were provided by Ericsson, uh, and we provided the compression part of this. And it went into, I think it was hole seven of the US Open. And there were two cameras there, which were ooh, Sony, let's have a look at this, HTC 4300s, that's right. So these have both a UHD HDR output and an SDR 720p output as well. Those were both compressed. Um, with the Ultra HD being 80 megabits per second, I don't recall what the S, the S, sorry, the HD resolution one was, and they were connected from this tower that you can see here back to the OB truck, which was down by the clubhouse using the 5G connection. So it did enable this kind of remote access from cameras, which would be very difficult to do otherwise. And although this was a trial. You can see the fact that it was two years ago means that doing it today would be much more feasible um, and much more realistic. So it's certainly true that the rollout of the more exotic capabilities of 5G will take some time, um, but it's coming and it's, it is going to enable some of these applications. Um, ultimately, this, this feed went over um, AT&T's DirecTV feed satellite to the home. So it really was used live on air for all seven, so it, it's been done. Then we can look at another sports environment, and we've talked. To, you've seen some of the backpacks that Craig talked about, and this is a scenario that that we've seen on numerous occasions where this is quite important. Cycling is is one of the interesting events from this perspective because what tends to happen is that you have mobile coverage of the cycle race, as I'm sure you know, with motorbikes, which familiar theme to us guys and they're filming that 
um, as the as the cyclists go through their their distance, so over many many kilometres. But at some point they get to the finish line, and the finish line is notoriously packed with lots of lots of spectators. Very good thing, as we as we all know, that's what makes it interesting. But the spectators are typically also trying to upload videos using the same mobile network um, at, at the same time as the the camera guys might be trying to use with the backpacks that you saw. Now in 4G, that has posed its issues to the extent where some of these these um, camera crews have ended up putting in a Wi-Fi station at the receive end because then they can do that privately and have that all to themselves as as the camera camera crew arrive near the finish line. Uh, but 5G will start to eliminate some of those difficulties because you can start to use some of the tools in 5G. Um, again, network slicing has a big role in that, having the, the flexibility to have an upstream, enough upstream traffic to be able to deliver that feed. Um, and of course, the distributed cloud again comes into this in terms of protection using SRT and, and guaranteeing latency end to end. So these are a few tools and a few applications which um, 5G are going to enable into the media space. There are a lot of things which are moving at the same time. You know, obviously the transition to Ultra HD is happening at the same time as the transition to IP and um, remote production. These are all interrelated and the connectivity is going to be an important part of this. I think if we look at the, the way that cloud providers, the public cloud providers are starting to reach out with their global networks and make those closer to the edge at the same time as the network operators telcos are starting to put compute towards the edge fairly soon there's going to be a fairly sophisticated joined up set of connections which go to um, go the round, around the world and also to a very fine degree of granularity with compute at various stages of the way on the way through that so it's quite radically changing landscape through networking and compute through the cloud um, environments in distributed cloud and, and centralized and it's going to affect the way that production and delivery is done and i think that was the end of it from me so i'll head, hand that back over to you tony all righty tony thank you very much um and let me just grab control back so if we can, uh, if I can get uh, all the presenters to uh, spark up their cameras, uh, Peter, uh, if you want to join in, thank you. I'm and here. Excellent. Um, and if there are any questions, if uh, um, so, yeah, the, the first question was from uh, Fayaz Ahmed, who is here. Would you like to ask your question? I can unmute you, or I can ask a question for you. Oh, yes, would you like to ask or do you want me to ask it for you? Oh, maybe, are you there? I've unmuted you. Yeah, I'm here. Do you want to ask you a couple me? of questions? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, so I have first question that what is NFP SDN slicing in 5G? And uh, I'm also interested in any uh, online free PDF document that uh, can give me an in-depth uh, knowledge of uh, slicing and 5G networks. Does anybody want to speak to that? I, I didn't catch the first question. Can it what be is, repeated? What is NFV SDN slicing in 5G? Oh, okay. Um, like network virtualization. Is that what you mean? Uh, like uh, software defined networking? Um, the whole 5G platform, uh, depending on which vendor, because there are different approaches by Nokia, Ericsson, uh, Huawei, uh, ZT, they all, all and, and there's other vendors that are evolving now as well that are pure software plays. And um, the entire um, network, uh, normally when we talk about the network, 
we talk about software defined networks. And let me give you an example. If, if you have a production going on in Vancouver and you want to connect to, let's say, Los Angeles with 4G and wherever the core is, the core could be in Toronto. So the signal would travel from Vancouver to Toronto and then go through a border gateway and then go back all the way to the West Coast to, um, to LA. Well, there's a lot of latency and, and challenges there. And I've measured some of those uh, routes and some of them are over 30 hops through different networks and the latency and places for error are great. When we virtualize the network in a software defined network, we can have the command and control say in Toronto, but we can tell the data, we can separate the control plane away from the data plane. And we can tell the data to go from Vancouver right to LA, okay? And when we use uh, virtual network functions, we can, um, we can take a device, like say we're going to go at a studio in Toronto, and we can, it looks like a pizza box. We generically refer to it as a pizza box and Craig's company makes them and you plug in a software and when the box wakes up, um, let's say you plug it in at uh, a studio in Toronto and then the box wakes up and it calls home to a cloud. And it says, I'm box one, two, three, four, and I'm here in Toronto. Then the cloud knows who it is, it administrates it. And um, the cloud, uh, you saw in science uh, presentation, you talked about ONAP, which is the open network architecture. And that ONAP will then send down the personality to that box and say, you're gonna have a firewall, you're gonna have a router, you're gonna have a, a, a broadband connection, right? Uh, Craig, I see you nodding. So it's that kind of personalization. And then it tells it where it's connecting to. So it talks to ONAP first, but after that ONAP hands over the control and it might hand it over to Paramount Studios or somebody else's cloud. Um, and then, so then it gets virtualized there. Does that answer your question? Is that what you're really asking? Yeah, it's perfect answer. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Great, okay. Um, I have another question from Martin Prasad. Do you, Martin, would you like to ask it or do you want me to ask your question for you? I've opened your mic. You go ahead there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Martin asks, uh, then when will 5G be of real business value in benefits for media distribution? So it's a good good bell question. <laughs> <laughs> Crystal ball. I was thinking right. that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say I, I can't really answer that question's a tricky question. Um in terms of can we put that question again? I didn't get that, Peter. Um when will five G be of real business value in benefits for media distribution? Five G is being rolled out right now, but again, uh, to what M Michael alluded in his presentation, it could go to 2027. We, we don't know exactly, and we can't comment on when it'll be out. There's several phases into 5G, right? So um, after the the open spectrum, I think the spectrum is six months, I think the auction, then we can give a, an actual date. Uh, do you concur, Michael and Craig and Tony? What do you guys think? Yeah, I, I think we're still, uh... 2022 will be the start of it in major markets and then it'll start to propagate out after that but it'll be low band and mid band in Canada to yeah. start and the millimeter wave will come later um, and again with COVID we just had a delay last week so are there going to be more delays I don't know what the government's going to do but it's likely and just to add to that, there are initiatives with smart cities. Cities are um, incorporating certain certain 5G projects, but again, nothing will come to fruition till I think 2021, 2022. Yeah, theories so around the world as well. So, so uh, the um, the mid band spectrum is um, the one that's probably the the most popular in terms of rollout for high capacity 5G over the next few years. 
before millimeter wave becomes much more dominant and able to deal with the, the really high bandwidths. But that is necessary to deal with the increasing demand for media being delivered over 5G or over mobile. So it's going to happen, but as as you know, Mike and Sian were saying, it's going to happen in urban areas first because that's the most obvious place to roll it out, and it's the biggest win for the the, the number of people covered by that rollout. Um, so it will vary based on where you are, and it will vary based on the spectrum it's being used as well over time. And so it's not a simple answer, unfortunately. Okay, uh, let me th let me yeah, throw as, one as more. In most things. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was just uh, going to say. There's a, a pilot for millimeter wavelength going on in Richmond Hill right now uh, that is uh, fixed access wireless only, fixed wireless access. So it depends on if it's mobility or fixed wireless access. So there, there's different things going on. And um, you heard uh, Craig talk about private wireless too, Martin. Um, uh, Craig and I both have worked on uh, mining and in different uh, industries that are quite a bit farther ahead than even the public networks. So um, these private networks that Craig was talking about could evolve much quicker. I've been working on mining for two years already. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna say something similar is that it really depends on what you're gonna call the business and, and when the benefit can come in. Certainly, sir, there's a lot of private businesses. Um, to talk about 2022 is really disappointing but um, the, the reality is, is you've got to have the consumer devices. If you're talking about media, especially, until, until you get wide coverage of 5G devices, whether it be they tablets or phones or what have you, then um, the rest of it is all feeding into something that could be just as well done with you know, uh, post-production streaming. Um, but what the uptake is happening is if I point you down to what's going on in Argentina, Chile, Peru, um mexico even uh what's going on down there where they've already deployed 5g networks and, and 5g devices they're, they're doing it in stadiums so soccer stadiums are huge um, they do a lot of virtual reality and augmented reality pieces so you put on your goggles and you can actually go and and feel like you're sitting in the stands um, walk right down onto the field. Of course, you're not really, but it feels like that. You could be standing in the middle of the soccer field and have players running past you and everything else. And it, like that's a really immersive experience. Um, and right now it's being done through 5G cameras broadcast out to, to other devices. Um, and then there's applications that you'd have to put for the AR goggles or, or uh, onto a phone and, and just view on that or a tablet and do it that way all kinds of advertising revenue that's being added to this you know just like you would see on stuff but you actually at a live event you'd hold up your your phone and you'd see the live stadium but then all these other overlays are coming on with you know swooshes and zooms and animated characters and everything else um statistics so there's there's certain things there and now with covid it dovetails right into the watch from home market if you could get that stuff. So why would you have to go to see a hockey game when you could pay 20 bucks and, and watch it on your tablet at home and get the, the more immersive experience than you'd get from even sitting in the stands? Okay. Uh, Craig, you actually had a question for Michael. Uh, you asked Michael, please explain the impact of the spectrum auction on the private network user, if any. Can they use certain bands right away? Yeah, interesting. Um, you know, I, I've done a lot of private network and I, I was talking to Craig about it earlier that it's an old conversation for me, like 20 years old, um, because we've been trying to do it with WiMAX, which is largely gone now. WiMAX was a 4G competitor to LTE, but um, there's a lot of, um, private network uh, systems in Canada today, utility networks like the Hydro One, Hydro Quebec, BC Hydro, they all use the 1.8 gig band. It's a, a private network, it's not a cellular, but it's using 4G on it today. And um, um, now what? another thing, when this new uh, 3.5 gig opens up, that's going to go to auction, but there's some at 3.7 that is um, 
what's the term they use? Uh, lightly uh, licensed, lightly licensed. So it's a shared um, spectrum that anyone can use, but it's not exclusive. When they go to auction, they're gonna give it to certain frequencies to certain companies, the winners, whoever bids the, the most big bucks, and we're talking billion dollar auctions here. But in the lightly licensed 3.750 up to 3.9 gigs, that is still um, available. And we use that quite a bit in different parts of the country in a private network form. The 1.8 gig is probably gonna be opened up. The problem is, can I get equipment? It's what Craig just said. Can I get handsets that work in that band? But now that it's all software defined, I can make a radio anything I want it to be. Um, and it's pretty flexible. I have a radio in the next room here that will work any frequency from one kilohertz to uh, 1300 uh, megahertz in one handheld radio that is about half the size of my iPhone. It's unbelievable. Uh, it's made out of uh, Japan. So there's things coming that will be quite exciting in the future. Okay, we have one last question. Uh, this will be our last question. Beamforming, if a tower has 100 subscribers local to it, what are the limits to the beamforming? Will it target each user with a separate beam or aggregate users in, say, seven general areas and optimize for these seven areas? I don't want to hog it. So, so <laughs> Tony? <laughs> I can well, I think that. this is your every speciality, Mike. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, it will uh, uh, select each user individually. Um, in LTE 4G, we uh, typically, well, in 3G, we could handle 100 users on a tower. In, um, in 4G, we got up to about 2,048. <coughs> Excuse me. And now with... Um, 5G, we're going to go to maybe 10,000 simultaneous users um, per tower. It depends on the design of the tower and the configuration. There's a lot of variables to that question. But the beam forming is uh, like one millisecond slices. It's going to just keep sequencing around. And, and if all of us here, all of us on this call tonight, we're all on one tower, it would just keep flying around, picking it each one and giving us a slice of time. And then it would send packets, and then we'd have to wait till our next uh, uh, slice our came around. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Keep so, keep in mind one of the, the the most expected use of those two is is probably going to be autonomous vehicles. The really low latency um, can't drop any packets, you know, and and so as a car moves through a city, it'll be transferring and getting slices from different antennas as it goes through, but each car is going to get its own slice. It's not going to be a hub scenario or shared access. Yeah, and and I think it was Science said it's going to, they're going to create meshes. Maybe it was you, Craig, um, but there's going to be mesh configurations as well. So to talk to multiple cells at the same time, so it, it'd be like Tarzan swinging through the vines. He'll grab one vine, grab the next one, keep swinging and going through. So they're not always locked into one cell. We're, we're bringing the granularity of the, the cellular footprint way down, really small. And um, so there's a lot more connections that can be had. What the scary part is, how are we going to backhaul all this? And, um, and we need fiber for that. And... Bell and others have been rolling out their fiber for the residential, but that same fiber will be the infrastructure to support these hundreds and thousands or millions of small cells as we roll them out. So um, we the backhaul is the scary part, not the cell part. It's uh, how do we move all that traffic off the cells back into the clouds? Yeah. yeah. And, and this is where some of the challenges are going to happen for some bad decisions on optical networking, too. Certainly yeah. passive optical networking, PON or GPON, gigabit PON, um, passive optical. Remember passive, net, you know, hubs? <laughs> it's uh, not, not as good as switch, right? Um, so if, if things have, done with, have been done with GPON, even though it's fast, it's a hub. 
and, and it, it's sitting there and it's it's sharing stuff out. Great for broadcast, say, you know, if it, getting your Bell 5 to your home, perfect. But uh, for getting data to come back, you want to switch network. Yeah, that's going to be the challenge, I think. Okay, great. Hey, well, Peter, that's all the questions. I yes. have one, Peter. If I can jump in, it's Tony jump here. In. Um, I, I'm getting a little confused with, um, is this consumer driven, this technology, or is it industry driven or both? Like, I'm, I feel that it's a, if the consumer doesn't grab on, it's not going to be rolled out as quick as it would if they had the option. Am I misreading this? From my perspective, uh, I'm seeing a, a much bigger uptake of the consumer side of things um, and a lot of billable services for the carriers and the providers. They're, they're getting monthly fees to, for people to get rich content, um, you know, live augmented reality, virtual reality content, that type of thing. That's one, and gaming, online gaming, um, you know, a multiplayer gaming, head to head with no latency. Uh, so you get these gaming arenas and kind of, that's a huge market. Um, but the other side, as, as Michael had said, things with oil and gas, forestry, mining and, and stuff, uh, the ability to do, you know, a smart pipeline um, and, and have it with low latency and have automated drones that uh, are going out doing inspections and, and thermal imaging and, and, and different chemical imaging as well. Um, so there, there's certainly an industrial drive for it in the back end as well, but I, I think I think the the mass is going to come from consumer demand. Just to add to uh, Craig's comment here, I think a prime example is what's happening with the National Basketball Association, National Hockey League, where they're having empty stadiums and coming to playing games empty. They're going to change the game around with virtual reality and. Um, the ability to have fans at home watch the game live and get part of the fan experience. So I think you're going to see a lot of changes happening in the sports industry due to this COVID, in COVID pandemic. Uh, they're going to use this quickly, I think, in the States so the fans can experience this uh, from home. Right? Everything's going to be from the home, right? And once you have 5G at home, when the consumer drives this, um, this initiative, um, I think you'll see more and more um, products coming up. Yeah, I'll, I'll just throw in there, uh, Tony, um, this is too big, it's too colossal of a problem to hitch your wagon to one pony. Uh, we need a whole team, we need multiple revenue streams. The business case will only work if we have multiple revenue streams um, for both inbound and outbound. Um, you know, looking at bi-directionally, like distribution of sports and also the ingress as well as the egress. So, um, if I looked at it from a you know business case point of view, um, it, it's got to be a, a you know a jack of all trades, if I can use that term. And uh, Tony, to add, add a little bit onto that, I think the statistics that we've seen from uptake for the predictions for the use of the 5G networks say that that media is the big driver for it. It is video that's going to drive that. Um, and that means that there's going to need to be money from it, which I think is realistic in terms of advertising. Um, but also there's a demand shift, which is that more people have grown up with mobiles and see them as the first class devices rather than second class device, devices. And we can see a lot of that in some parts of, of Southeast Asia in particular, where and, and in fact Northeast Asia too, you can see the mobility consumption massively increasing, much more so than in Western Europe and, and North America. But it'll happen in Western Europe and North America too. Um, so we can realistically expect the demand to grow quite dramatically. And with it, and with the increase in the size of the screen, the amount of data that's going to need to be used to feed that, that will be there too. So I think the demand is inevitable and media is, is the biggest part of it already and is only going to grow as a proportion. Okay. okay, I'm going to turn Good. it over to you, Tony, and you can wrap up. Alrighty. So let me uh, start by uh, thanking everybody, uh, all the presenters, Michael, uh, Craig, 
Cyan and Tony for uh, being uh, part of this uh, 5G technology discussion. Uh, I do have a couple of uh, closing slides. Um, uh, Simpty um, has some virtual courses that they're offering at 50% off, so uh, there's a discount code there. Um, there's also a 50% renewal if um, you've uh, found yourself unemployed. They are uh, looking at uh, helping people uh, uh, through these uh, uh, troubled times. And all of the uh, webcasts are free, and um, you can go to simply.org to find out more information about this. Um, this uh, meeting has been recorded or is being recorded, um, so we will make that available. Um, you will get a survey in about, uh, sorry, you will get an email, which will also have a survey attached to it in about two days. And we need two days because we have to prep the uh, the recording because it, it does it in uh, go to webinar speak and we have to change it to, uh, or get it converted over to uh, an MP4. Um, so you'll you'll receive an email and uh, a link to our YouTube channel, and it should be uh, uh, hopefully uh, it should be there by uh, Thursday, if I'm not mistaken, Peter. Um, That's good. Hope to have it there Thursday. Perfect. Um, next season, this is the. Um, the end of our 2019 and 2020 uh, season and uh, come September, it'll be our 2020-2021 season for uh, SEMPTE. In September, we're gonna have uh, remote productions, uh, October remote music productions, and uh, again in June, we hopefully will have our technical conference. By then, uh, we'll be back into being able to do face-to-face. Uh, so far, uh, we will be doing uh, webinars for the uh, uh, the rest of the uh, meetings that we do. Um, we're looking at other technologies as well um, on top of uh, a webinar. Um, here's where you can uh, grab hold of us, uh, our website, um, if you want to become a friend and um, get uh, notifications on what we do. Uh, there's the link, um, and then there's Facebook, Twitter, and our email address. So um, this is uh, the final slide. Um, I'd like to wish everybody uh, the best of health and um, uh, to you and your families, and stay well and stay safe. And uh, if I can, what I'm going to do to the presenters, I'm going to put this back into practice mode so that we can continue our conversation. If I can do that, if I can't do that, then uh, we will connect by uh, by email. So um, that's it for this evening, and uh, thanks very much to everybody for uh, joining. Bye bye. Good night. Hi, folks.